So today we are in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored, as happened among you, and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men. For not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord about you, that you are doing and will do the things that we commanded. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. Good morning, Vicki. So in this chapter, Paul begins to urge them to pray. He begins to urge them to pray. Now, you know, we, we've unpacked a couple other books already, and this tends to be one of the first things that Paul calls us to, is to pray. There, there's something about prayer, individually and corporately, that's powerful. It's very powerful. Good morning, Pat. And, and I don't think we often do it enough. Now we pray, and kind of like I said on Sunday, we pray with our, our list and our needs. But then we don't listen. Prayer is a two-way communication, and Paul urges them to prayer. He urges them to a deeper passion and time and understanding for being with God. In fact, the word that he uses is the tense of it it actually would have been better translated keep on praying keep on keeping on don't stop don't let the passion and the fire to pray grow dim keep it going you know i think even in my own life there have been times where i prayed a lot One such moment was uh, in a cave. My brother and I had given ourselves up for dead. It's a story for another time. If you haven't heard bits of it, we did not expect to make it. And can I tell you, I prayed like I never prayed before. And for a while after that, I prayed like I never prayed before. And then it, if we're not careful, starts to grow a little more routine. Paul challenges the Thessalonian church and us not to forget prayer. Not just as a cursory glance over our food, but as a deep, abiding, growing, living in prayer pray continually right he then asks for prayer he asks for prayer that the gospel will spread and it'll spread swiftly and successfully right you know the gospel the good news of jesus christ the the good news the word of the lord it's what he wants to spread You know, that good news is not Paul's message. It's not my message. It's not any other pastor's message. It's the message of Jesus Christ, that God is the author and grace is the subject matter. That's what he wants to spread. Knowledge about Jesus Christ and grace, his saving grace. This gospel, Paul prays, will grow and expand. He's beginning to see it. You know, see how one person can affect another person. Who It's, it's, the, uh, it's a good Ponzi scheme, right? <laughs> good morning, Brooke. It's where one believer witnesses to another individual who gets saved, who witnesses to 
two or three more who witnessed to two or three more. And before you know it, it begins to explode. And that's what Paul was beginning to see was the growing of the church just by word of mouth. He couldn't be everywhere and do everything. You know, as your pastor, I can't be everywhere and do everything. It requires the church, the body of Christ, going out in their passions. Second thing is he prays that he and his team won't be hindered by evil, by evil men. Now notice he doesn't call out who they are. He doesn't call out Rome. He doesn't call out the, the laws of the nation that are maybe holding him back, the empire. He, he calls out evil men. He calls out those who are living, acting, working in evil. Some of these, he doesn't say they were all outside the church. We often see later in some of his letters that some of them were inside the church. We'll see in Timothy, some of the look at the Gnosticism that was seeking to be entered. Because sometimes even, dare I say, even well-meaning believers, we sometimes, if we're not careful, can spread evil. We can spread evil. Falsities. You know, I've I've dealt with quite a bit the old mantra of, well, you're sick because you didn't have enough faith. Or you're depressed or you're anxious because you don't have enough faith. And can I say that that's a, a, a lie? <laughs> um, dare I even go so far as say it's a lie straight from Satan? To try to make individuals feel like second-class Christians. We could go through even our church and other churches and list the names of individuals who have died from disease and different things. And was it their faith? Their lack of faith is why? No. How, how dare we say that? You are, by doing that, we take the voice of God as if it's our own. And we often, as if we're not careful, can speak into. We can. I've seen some churches lately, and this one might, uh, I probably shouldn't say, but I've seen some churches who, at the beginning of all of this with COVID, um, their mantra was, God has not given us a spirit of fear, so therefore we're not going to wear a mask. And the problem has been is they've lost faith. They've lost face when they've had to go back and say, you know what? Um, it's a little more than just faith. We, we, we need to wear a mask because it keeps you safe. But because of their own emotional state in the moment, they take verses out of context, out of the cultural meaning, out of the meaning for us today, and they try to apply it in isogesis to only this moment, this isolated moment, and therefore say, this person's of the devil, this person's of God, this, this mask is of the devil, this is, and we must be careful. Don't speak as if speaking for God. Dare I say there are individuals, well, I won't even, I won't go there. Never mind. But Paul calls out the evil around them. Some even in the church. His focus was that the message of Jesus Christ would spread, that message of hope, of peace, and love, and joy, that it would spread and spread through all the world as he was starting to see it do. He wanted to see it spread. His focus was on that, not on his afflictions, not on his persecutions, not on the fact that he couldn't be with the Thessalonians. He, he was focusing on the message of Jesus Christ. The gospel of grace, that was his only and his primary focus. Later, he would say, I preach Christ and him crucified, right? That was the main thing. 
He prayed that it would spread rapidly. In some translations, it said rapidly or, or to be sped on. Ours says to speed ahead that I read in ESV, but to speed on is the literal kind of translation that the gospel would speed on, speed on, that it, would, it wouldn't stop. It wouldn't look back. When we share the message of Jesus Christ, we should be praying that it speeds on that it speeds on until it finds a willing recipient, someone with ears to hear. But instead, we don't often pray for it to speed on, and in fact, we're just happy with it where it is. And so when we go through, and not, not our church, you know, but often in churches, and we don't see a convert, in years and they say well that's because you're a preaching pastor and no 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 it's because you don't know anybody who's not saved or you're not witnessing to anybody who's not saved right the gospel didn't spread because paul was the only one evangelizing the gospel spread because he taught it to the believers and the believers went out and witnessed and brought people in we sometimes sit in our ivory or our brick towers and we just expect people to come in and, and that happens. The Holy Spirit can draw people. But it's up to us. It's up to us to go out, to witness, to help speed the gospel on. And so my prayer is that we would again begin to pray that the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of grace would rapidly spread to the entire world and it would start with us. That we would not be able to contain what is inside us. That we would want to share it with others. And in a way that draws, not in a way that condemns, right? Sometimes we've shared it in, the, in that manner, maybe not us, but we've seen it done where it's a manner of smacking them over the head, telling them everything they're doing wrong. Instead of saying, can I tell you how I have hope? Things seem crazy right now, but can I tell you how I have peace and joy? It's not a what, but it's a who. Let me tell you who I've found. He then prays that the, this gospel, this gospel of grace, the word of God would be honored. That's the desired response of our hearts is to honor God and his messengers, that we would honor the word of God being spoken. But you know what Satan does, and I've been there, and I'm not saying anyone does that in, in our church. I would hope not, but I'm sure it happens. But I know I've done it, is I sit there, and I critique. I critique. Instead of hearing the word of God, I sit there and go, well, one of the first things you learn in communication, and I was a communications major first, was um, you don't say words like, um, you know, you don't, you don't have filler words. And so I'll count those. I'll get distracted and I'll begin to count the number of times. I'll begin to, to pay attention and go, well, that point never fulfilled itself. They never followed that back up. Or they mentioned this at the beginning, they leave you hanging and they never came back to it. Or, or they only said one out of seven points and clearly, and so I don't know where they were going. And, and, and I critique the messenger. Careful. The word of God is to be honor, that desired response to honor God and to honor his messengers. We're to receive the word with faith. To receive the word. The, the word is the, the what, the who that transforms us. The what being the scriptures and the who being the Holy Spirit, God the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you know, who transforms us just as it was with you, he reminds them, just as it was with the Thessalonians, that their past and their acceptance of the gospel, that this would rapidly spread and be honored throughout the world as his prayer, that they would become the model, the model for all who would be believing, you know, come to know Christ. You know, sometimes sometimes I would take a biker drug dealer who gets honestly saved 
over a 30-year believer. Now, we need both. Okay, hear me out. But maybe you've seen it where somebody comes to know the Lord and they are so pat they don't they don't know the ins and outs. They don't know where to find anything in scripture and they don't care. The only thing they care about is what Jesus has done in their life and they can't stop sharing it with everybody and they blow your church away with the number of people that they bring in and yet we who've been around for a long time who've been saved who maybe have the knowledge who might have the 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 wisdom and discernment of god because we've been around longer somewhat lost that passion we, we we see it as being naive and we're like well that'll end soon we should be praying for more of that we should be praying for more people to be transformed to cause the gospel to rapidly spread because we need something that rapidly spreads hope and peace and joy in our nation right now we need something that rapidly, I, I just picked up this morning, I have individuals that are um, friends that are in uh, missionary fields and in orphan care fields, and Ethiopia right now is going through a major revolt. We don't see it in the news, but the government warned the, the opposition army that uh, their primary city where they're held up, that they will not give quarter to anyone. And the UN and others are already saying that there are going to be some great war crimes, atrocities, human uh, rights violations, because they don't care if you're a citizen or not, uh, an innocent bystander or not. If you're in their way, they're going to kill you to get to the center to take out this revolt. That's been made known. But we don't see that in our news, right? It, it's these small things. Our world needs a gospel of grace, of love, of peace, of hope, of joy to spread rapidly. It was an ongoing process. It moves to the ends of the earth. It would rapidly spread all over. A theologian by the name of A.L. Moore said, the request for prayer recognizes the participation for all Christians in the church's mission, and that it is not the prerogative or responsibility only of those who preach and teach. Because if we're not careful, we act like there's only a small few to do the work. That's the worst thing about having a church, about having staff. We expect them to do it all. We expect them to clean up the leaves that have blown up or a tree that's fallen over. We, we expect them to paint the walls. We expect them to do all the counseling. We expect them to do all the witnessing. We expect them to do all the teaching and the, the walking alongside mentoring of others. But the message was never intended for a select few. We're all called as you go to make disciples. To help people discover Jesus, to disciple everyone, and to deploy the church. We're all called to that. Paul then moves in the last part of these verses, these first five verses, Paul moves from a call to prayer for himself and the message to the needs of the Thessalonian converts. And he moves from prayer to reassurances. He intermingles in these thanksgivings and these exhortations and prayers Paul's concern over his separation from them is again becoming evident and his concern about them being attacked by evil, being led astray by evil ones. In all his worries, he reminds them, though, the Lord is faithful. God is faithful. His confidence is grounded in Jesus Christ. My hope is built in nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. 
steadfast confidence is grounded in the Lord. The Lord will provide strength and protection and that it should foster and grow in us a confidence in the one who teaches in the name of the Lord and in those being discipled, that we should have a confidence that flows out of God's word, out of the message. God is ever faithful and he is ever true. To him alone, we look for courage, for strength and stability, and for protection and deliverance. To him alone. So as we head into this week of Thanksgiving, there might be some things we're not very thankful for right now. But the Lord is faithful. The Lord is faithful. As we head into Advent, this longing, we're, we're longing and waiting for COVID to be done. I had another text this morning from somebody who's getting tested. So we're ready for it to be over. But while we wait, a year is nothing in comparison to the Israelites over 400 years of silence from God, over 400 years that they were in Egypt. It's nothing compared to the years of captivity by the Assyrians, years of captivity by the Babylonians in exile, not even able to worship. A year is nothing. What if this doesn't stop? What if it continues to go? Where does our hope lie? Well, God is faithful. He alone is faithful. Heavenly Father, this week, as we move to Thanksgiving and into Advent, the waiting, that remembering what you did for us so long ago, sending your Son, May we pray that the gospel, the gospel of grace would grow, it would spread, it would speed on, it would rapidly be sought out, and it would be honored. God, would it start with us sharing it with family? Maybe this is the first time ever that we as a believer would Share Christ with our family, not in a, I don't like the way you're living and here's how you ought to live, but in a, you know, you seem like you're, you're searching. You seem like you're longing. You seem like you're waiting for something. You seem like you're desperate to fill a void. Yeah, I once was there. But can I tell you? Can I tell you what I filled it with? Who I filled it with? God, we ask and we pray, we plead that the message of the cross, the gospel of Jesus Christ would spread rapidly once again. Start with us, start in our church, go to our village, to our county, our state, our country, and our world, God. We need you. We need you. Remind us that you are still faithful. We'll give you all the praise, all the glory. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, go in peace and hope you have a great rest of the day.